welcome to yet another episode of Grange TV. We have once again with us Mr. David Roberts, yeah. Robert Whitaker, UFC middleweight champion. <laughs> now, it's almost a year now since young Roberts fought. <laughs> and two very special guests, Nick Linton and Rich Craney from Winter Warrior, going to have a chat about all things MMA and uh, delve into the, the weird and wonderful world of Winter Warrior. We, we uh, should do something special for my one year anniversary. I'll fight for not fighting. It's my birthday on the same day. Yeah, we should do something. We should do like a combined thing. Well, you don't fight. Yeah. <laughs> no, no fighting. <laughs> no fighting. <laughs> Absolutely no fighting. Um, I don't know, let's kick off. Did you watch the UFC on the weekend? I haven't seen the main event. I recorded the the card and, and I still haven't watched. I wanted to take some time to watch the, the main event properly, but I watched all the other fights up until then. But I was, I was sad to hear about Gustafson... Um, you know, retiring and saw all the media around that. Actually, saw it, that was a great post by Daniel Cormier and John Jones, super generous towards him. So <laughs> John Jones straight, I was like, I don't believe you. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, you don't have to say it. Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you think, Rich? Um, yeah, it's, it's a shame. I think he's in that hard place where he's he's as high as he can go. While John Jones is sitting there, he's just like, you know, what do I do? You know, and I think that was a hard loss. Two losses in front of his home crowd as well, and that hit hard. But you know, it might be knee jerk. I think um, would he have retired if he won? Definitely not. So he might go away and, and have a think. But he's in a hard place. I think he's a talented fighter. I, I love the way he fights. I really like his fighting style. But yeah, it's it was sad for him for sure. What do you think, Lord? Um <coughs> Well, I was thinking about the fight, I suppose, yeah. and, and the um, fight or and the stuff since mm -hmm. retiring. Well, before that though, uh, like um, there's a new can, like a new guy in the heavyweight division that's coming up. Light heavyweight. Light heavyweight. Sorry. Yeah. Um, with that that knockout on Manuel, like that was pretty impressive. Yeah. Like I think that should, especially in that, that light heavyweight sort of division. I think that that'll. Well, they're starting to get a lot of new blood in there because like with some of the new words coming up as well. That yes. Yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, hundred percent. What are what are the new words moving up? Like the Tiago Santos as well. Well, he's going to fight. Jones. Yeah. So, yeah, so welcome. The light, the light heavyweight division is starting to look very interesting. You know, it's getting mixed up a bit. Um, you know, with 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 uh, Gustafson, like um, I, I didn't I didn't realise until like I started looking into it after he had retired. But he's been in the UFC for ten years. Ten years of, of fighting is like I mean that's not including all the fights he had before that whether re registered or not like I mean, that's a long time to be mm -hmm. especially in the UFC like the UFC is a it's a it's an organisation where the, everyone's hungry everyone's trying to kill each other like that's that's like the the wolf pack sort of thing like everyone's everyone's trying to kill each other in there yeah. and uh, to to be in there for ten years. And to, to fight big names like mm. Rumble and then Jones mm. twice and then yep. DC and then all that like it's tiring. That's got to be tiring. Like that's yep. got to be hard. You know, I'm sure you reach a point where you're like, especially when you've had a couple hard losses like he has, where you're like, man, can, can I like I just can't keep doing this. Well, maybe maybe he does. He does just like how old is he now? How old is 34. he? Thirty-four. Thirty-four. So I guess he, oh, yeah, well done. Yeah. He's not young, but he's not old. Yeah. But would you but you saying that like I was about to say like maybe he does take a couple of years off to mm. to get some energy, but he can't no. he can't come back last year at thirty six. No. That'd be very hard. So yeah, like it's just you do reach a point where you're just like you know I don't want to get hit anymore. Yeah. Like these losses are hard. Like people would say everybody loses, but when when you lose, a part of you dies. Like it sucks, mm. and uh, especially in, in the sport that we're in, like mixed martial arts, losing isn't just a, a, a one next to your win tally. Losing is physical trauma, mental trauma, yeah. the weeks, financial, <coughs> like huge financial hits, especially with these UFC guys, because if you lose, you really get paid half of what you could potentially be making, you know? So, um, and then the, the months of investment financially, of, of training, of, of especially the, the mental side of things you go through leading into a fight, like, how many times can you do this for? How many? How long can you do it for? Like ten years in the UFC is like huge credit to him. That's that's yeah. that's a. I think that's like a big milestone. If you if you last ten years in the UFC, that's that's a huge amount of time. It's funny you're saying it because I reflected. I actually saw one of his earliest fights. The first 
live UFC I saw in the States was in Las Vegas. I went to UFC 141, and that was the main event was um, Brock Lesnar and Alistair Overeem, and that was very clearly pre-USADA days back then. But but um, he was he fought on the undercard then. Who did he fight in that fight? Was it um, Sean Davis? No, he fought a really tough um, journeyman like a Croatian. We'd have to look up the card. But I forget the. I forget the guy, but he he was a guy who'd had a lot of time in, in the UFC at the time, and, and yeah, Gustafson looked, he was just a young kid then, but just so slick, rangy, great boxing, movement, you know, you reflect and you go, UFC 141, that's a long time ago, that guy's been around. I think his debut was 101. Yeah, right. Like, it, like, like I said, like, 10 years is a milestone, like a huge milestone, because everyone says it, um... It's, it's e easier, I'm not going to say it's easier to make the UFC, it's easier to get into the UFC, it's much, much, much harder to stay in the UFC, yeah. and uh, to be there for 10 years, like, like his career was amazing, yeah. you know, he should be very proud of himself. I, I'm, um, I'm a huge fan of his, I've been, especially for, you know, for uh, Jamie. For, I'm not. I like. I was going for Jamie. So <laughs> I was going for for James. But um, like, well, like James listening. Yeah. Yeah. James, I was going for you. <laughs> don't back that. Uh, uh, just a little bit. Don't back that. No, I was actually speaking to James just before he fought. <coughs> I mean, before he fought um, the stuffs. And so I've, I've been like watching the stuffs and like more closely because he was going to fight James as well. Um, so I always had that vested interest kind of thing. And then when when you me personally, like if someone unless they're a total fuckwit, but if someone beats someone that I know, one of my friends or something, I kind of always want that person to do well. Yes. You, don't want, you don't want your yeah. mate to lose to someone <laughs> that's fucking lost every fight after. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, I hope he gets a belt. Fucking yeah. go, Gustafsson. Yeah. Yeah. And he's not a tool. He doesn't seem to be a tool. Yeah. So I was always like a big fan of his. Uh, the, so as much as I like to watch him fight, I'm actually glad that he retired because I don't think enough fighters are pulling the pin early enough do you know what I mean mm. where you know it's fucking dangerous you know and if you're watching like whether you're winning or losing I think sometimes it's arbitrary it's like a you know some judges decisions so to watch people take trauma and you watch them take it at like really close to them and that yeah, it's 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 serious you know it's mm. like getting hit like straight to the brain you know it's not so I'm, I'm kind of glad that, that he called it you know like uh we, and, and that he's leaving more or less on top. Like he's still, he's not going out there and cannon fodder in like a smaller show. Sure, yeah. That 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 makes sometimes when I see that it makes me sad. Or I bump into dudes that they're like my age and thirty nine. Um, we trained with before, and then you you bump into them and the guys aren't. Yeah, they're yeah. not. They're not there no more. You know, yeah. they're not in the, in the same way. And that 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 kind of makes me sad. So hopefully, you know, he he's. Um, yeah, he's on to bigger and better things. Yeah, that, that always makes it hard. Like, I, yeah, I agree with you that um, it's hard seeing, like, a lot of those guys that go from UFC and just keep fighting in, like, the smaller shows, trying yeah. to get back in there. Yeah. It's like, that's hard. I'm not even getting back in there. Some guys are never going to get back in there. It's mm. just, like, I don't know. It's sad. It makes it real, real sad for it, me. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things. It's like they're, they're And you want to say to people, you want to say, like, People are watching that, oh, this guy's shit. And they're like, dude, do you know that, that guy? Yeah. yeah. Whoever that guy is, I'm like, dude, people like the professional fighters didn't want to catch elevators with him. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, yeah. They, they dodge him all they could. Yeah. Gus's, mm -hmm. Gus's style is one of those ones that, that split second timing, once that goes, being a, <clears throat> the striker and his movement patterns and stuff, he's always going to be on the catch up. But his chin's kept still. His chin's kept with him, which I think is really impressive. And normally these guys get in their mid 30s. That are banging all their all their career, their chin goes, and then that's it. But I think he's, I think he's stepping out at the right time. I, I think it's sad for him because it's it's the loss at home. Whereas if he was in Vegas, he could leave all that behind, go home, and yeah, yeah. you know. And, but to have it in front of his home crowd, I think it's going to be a little bit, a bit tough for him to go over. But, do, you, um, do you feel more pressure fighting at home? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Like um, not. I don't feel more pressure like in, in, in the actual fight. Just the lead up there is a bit more pressure. It's, it's, it's not that it, I guess it is a pressure in a sense because like so many friends come, so many people come. People on the street run, you run into you go, I'm, going, I'm coming down to Melbourne, I'll see you there. Mm. And it's just, it's like, you don't have to. Like, 
Just mm. you watch it at home. It's fine as well. <laughs> you know what I mean. So, and I, I like. I, that's why I, I do like enjoy fighting overseas because it's just like there's no one there usually. Yeah. And it, and it's just I don't have to worry about it. the crowd hates me, which is great. <laughs> I love that, and I just go out there and do my thing. But um, yeah. But, but, but this next one, this is going to be the this is going to be the biggest mixed martial arts event Australia's ever seen. Yeah, well, maybe the biggest combat sports, sports event. event. Yeah, they're saying they're saying here in Vegas. Yeah. Oh, really? Mm. That's fucking stupid, eh? Yeah. Are you serious? Why are they going to Eddie, eh? Or whatever it's called now. They they booked it in on the, on the same time as the grand final. Oh. And, like, they, they're, they're not moving it. Hmm. And um, then, like, now, you know, the the talk that you're hearing is of them doing it in... Um, they, this is just talk that I... No one's said anything to me. Right. But this is shit that I've just heard. Um you know, about doing it maybe in, in the US and I think it's you have a fucking New Zealand is crazy. Australian yeah. you know and you're going to fight in, in the US you know like this fucking I would have thought just that main event alone and then you'd see what happens with maybe with Alex getting a you know Alex and Max if, if Max beats Frankie or whatever and you think if they could sell out um, whatever Eddie had's called these days and I you know I was there for that and it was 50 odd thousand or whatever but this the main event alone, you guys could sell that thing out. That's you, I just don't understand why they would, well, scheduling wise, I suppose, but that's a huge missed opportunity if. I, I think it's it's crazy. I think like all the good Australian fighters we have, like Bam Bam, Tyson Pedro, Jake Matthews, mm. I'm gonna miss people, so I'm not, uh, but I'm sure saying like, like you yeah. have like such a good card and there's up and coming guys, we've got like a couple, two, three really good up and coming guys at our gym. They would do really, really well in the UFC, really mm. do some damage. Um, you could get them on things like you could have Australian, you could have like probably a whole Australian New Zealand card, you know, yeah. mm. just about. Obviously, you need yeah. international names for Europe and for the US, but um, like last time, the, the, the tickets <coughs> sold like straight away, you yeah. know, was... and you didn't even fight. <laughs> you <know? laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> you know, so no, no that, that's I, I, I find that rule. Sad man, if you do it yeah. in the US, like it's the first I've heard. Oh, what a shame! That's what they were talking about. I, I don't know, like, that's the, the rumblings yeah. I've heard. Mm. Oh, no, man, I hope huh? it doesn't. What a shame! <laughs> what a shame if it's in the US. I think it's a massive missed <laughs> opportunity. I think <laughs> for them, I um, yeah, it is what it is. Like, just yeah, no. <laughs> Fighting the US is, is fine as well. Yeah, fighting, I think... For I me, think, like, from, like... From your perspective, yeah, yeah but... I'm, I'm saying from, like, a, a marketing perspective, from, like... For, like you said, it'll be probably the biggest combat event... Mm. For sure. It for Australia, yeah. right? I can't, like... Maybe, I don't know, like, Nelson and um, Fennec back in the day or something. Yeah. I can't really think of... Mundine's cards have always pulled, but they, yeah. they've always, like, pay-per-view on that. This this would be monstrous. Yeah. But, yeah. but I don't think it... I don't think they had the significance that this one would have... Yeah. You know, so I, I I think it's shit that if they do it in the US yeah. for sure. It's Thank also you. for the sport though. You know, generally for mixed martial arts, <clears throat> whenever we have a big card over here, we see it at grassroots. You know, through through gyms and through Rinto or whatever. There's always this big surge, yeah. more interest in the sport. So that's I mean, these guys being in Australia would be would be massive for Australian MMA. Mm. So that's what that's what pisses me off if they do do it in the US as well. That's such a missed opportunity. For, for Aussie MMA and the growth, but you know we're not the ones that decide. I hope so. they don't do it on the on the which they will. I reckon they will on the um, grand grand final weekend, which is. Uh, oh. I hope someone's explained to them that <laughs> the crossover between the rugby league audience and people who buy pay per view. You know, like that Australia's a pretty big market for them still. You know, <laughs> and a huge market for this this fight. So anyway. It's insane. Mm. Did you guys watch um, the boxing, Joshua and Riz? Highlight only. Yeah, highlights. Yeah. You yeah. Didn't, did, did, I saw extended highlights, but yeah. What did you think? Oh, I mean, <laughs> it's funny. It's the biggest reminder that it's um, it's not a body composition competition, right? Like those big boys can hit and and to see Ruiz get clipped early but then come back and... Um, First time he's been down too. Mm. So, I mean, I, I hadn't followed the build-up closely enough and people had said, what was amazing was I did read that um, Ruiz, 12 months ago, knocked back 30 grand to fight him. Um, he was managing himself at the time and apparently the story goes he held off. 
he got that fight. He's got to paid a million bucks for that. Now he's got the guaranteed rematch clause. So, <laughs> good, you know, good one for the underdog. That's I for sure. Uh, good decision. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I think um, I'm, I'm not. I used to be a big boxing fan, but I don't follow it as much anymore. But um, I always like seeing the, the big boys go in there because you never know what's going to happen. You know, the the punch I saw looked like it caught him behind the ear. Yeah. Um, was, was going to rattle anyone. He catch someone, especially those big boys. It's done. Um, but yeah, it's. Um, I think these upsets are always good. You know, I think um, um, there's a lot of. Uh, I saw a lot of um, stuff on social. You know, the dad bod brigade and all that coming out and all this and. <laughs> so, that's just. Yeah, it is what it is. Like, it'd be interesting to see what happens with the rematch. That's a little. That's annoying, eh? Mm. Like, <laughs> I see it all the time as well. It's like all those pictures of people saying like the, the dad bod there yeah. with DC as a picture as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, this is the optimal. And, and, and the guys yeah. that are saying this, like, they're, they're saying like, oh, anyone could do it. Like, we could do it. Like, like oh, man, <laughs> you, you got to train, bud. Like, yeah. these yeah. guys train ridiculous amounts. Yeah. So, like, and it's that's just how, like, exactly what you said before. So it's just that body compositions aren't indicative of them not being fit. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's just guys, the way yeah. that. Yeah. They'll never win a bodybuilding comp. That's where they hold weight. Yeah. But Ruiz is like fit. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? He's like yeah. a fit dude. Um, the the thing, I, I didn't think he'd beat Joshua, but when, the way people were talking about it, I was thinking like, it won't be that easy. I know, you know, Joshua's a big puncher and everything, but when you look at Ruiz, Ruiz went, went to went to the Olympics for Mexico. Um, he's had over 100 amateur fights. I think he's only lost five. And... Joseph, you can't do the, the maths, the combat mm. maths, but mm. they, they are figures, you know, if you look at it, yep. like Parker and Joshua went the distance, and he went the distance with Parker, yep. Ruiz went the mm. distance with Parker, it's not like, um, you know you know what I mean, it's not like he just, sure. it's not like they put me in there with Joshua, yeah. and they go, yeah. oh my god, if I won, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. that would be, <laughs> <laughs> everyone would freak out about that, but, yeah. but no one looks at those stats, unless you're a real avid sports yeah. fan, right? They see the pro stats and you know, and just that's what they look at. I, I, I thought I thought Joshua was going to win, but but um, <clears throat> it like not didn't surprise me. I'm not going to say that, but um, he's like he got fast hands. Riz has got fast hands. Hits real hard. Really mm. good chin. Mm. He gets like in and out from underneath, you know, and he's and that's how he hit him. Like, yeah, yeah. So I I didn't think Joshua would lose. I didn't think he'd. I didn't think he'd lose that fight. He he just looked on top of the world. Mm. He looked like, like a monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like physically, like yeah, he's yeah. A, not even as a, as a, as a whole package. He's got the pedigree too. As, as a whole package, he is a specimen. Like yeah. he is, he's fit, strong, long arms, tall, rangy, can box with the like a, mm. like a demon. You know what I mean? Like he just. I didn't I, like. It was very hard. Like when I saw him at the, the when I saw him at the face off, like I was like, Joshua's gonna kill this guy. But I was surprised. <laughs> did, did you guys have a view on, because um, Deontay Wilder ripped into him because when he got that last standing eight count and he had his hands on the ropes and the ref saying, are you ready to go? And he was, it looked as though he was saying yes and he might have still been scrambled, but he was kind of saying yes, but no. And it was, it was interesting um, that, that Wilder just ripped straight into him on social media saying, you know, he, he quit and that was sort of, I don't know, maybe that's adding spice to those guys, you know, fighting in the future. But well, it makes you makes you think of like how that fight would go, Wilder and Joshua. Well, that'd be a big fight. Do I do I think are you asking me if I think Anthony Joshua is a coward? No, no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if I had my time, I'd kill him. <laughs> I would have gone off the ropes. No. I would have if you hit me, I would have gone off the ropes easy. <laughs> I, I don't think I think like You'd you still get, be in intensive care. Yeah, I'd be dead. <laughs> yeah. Like I think like people don't understand me <laughs> when you get hit when you if you get hit like that. I don't even know that he'd even know where he was. No. Yeah. He'd be like, Mum, I'm not going to school today. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to just turn the yeah. shower off. I'm not going to school. Like, I don't think he'd know even where he is. Like, yeah. You get hit because he got dropped four times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the fourth time he got dropped, like, the people don't give him, like, you know, people, oh, he's da 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 da. Dude, he got dropped four times. as he a quitter? You know? Well, that's why I thought it was weird. For why did Wilder just piled straight in on him straight away? But maybe that's just building for them to fight. Maybe he just wanted some spice in there. Who knows? Man, I'm, I'm like, credit to him if he got up three times from mm. that. Man. It's 
kick him. He got he, he got dropped down. twice in that third round and took bombs as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Ruiz's cardio surprised the hell out of me. But like, but he's got good cardio. I, like he's, he's, I understand that now. Like I'm not a huge boxing fan. I was looking. I at thought Joshua was going to win though. He doesn't look like a like a like a like a cardio machine. You don't look but, at him and be like, okay, that guy <laughs> that guy's built for triathlon. Yeah. No 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 no. But he um, he he just unloaded. And did just you see kept, the thing the about pace. how they how the came out that apparently Joshua had been uh, knocked out in camp. Oh right. Mm. Yeah, I didn't see that. during during the camp, and that that's that's big as well. Like I, I don't know, but. Fuck, you fight, you fight. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. Hmm. Um, I guess we'll transition to these two gentlemen here on the, on the left. Um, you tell us, like, starting at the beginning, like, what, what did you do before Wimp to Warrior? Like, sure. as, a, as a young fellow, and you too, Nick? Yeah, sure. Um, How long have you known each other? Sorry, before... Uh, um, since 2013. 2013, yeah. Okay. So, um, I, left, I did boxing through school. <clears throat> I was originally from London. Boxed through school, going to martial arts... Um, opened my first gym in London in um, 19, I'm not freaking memory now, 1995. Um, <clears throat> and then um, the Gracies came over to, to London to do a seminar um, because the UFC was just, it was the old VHS stuff. So everyone's got the same kind of story. I watched the first one. And, but that was, our, our fighting style, our martial art was very much... Um, um, street fighting, you know, we used to elbows, knees, clinch, but we had no ground game whatsoever. And then um, Grace had come over and invited um, a group of black belts from different federations to come down and train. So we're like, yeah, yeah. Anyway, just, we're just like, holy shit, this is a massive eye opener for us. You know, we, we pride ourselves on being street smart martial art. And um, so. So you were doing a martial arts that mm, was. Uh, it was all, all stand up. Yeah, there was yeah no but, it, but it was like self-defense based martial arts. Um, well, it was um, it was it was a derivative of uh, Choi Kwon Do, which was a break off from Taekwondo back in the day, um, which was Master Choi created it as a as a street form of Taekwondo. So no locking movements, flowing hands. Your hands are very much like boxing, um, and then that kind of evolved into clinch work and knees and elbows. How and why did you get into martial arts? I just trouble kid. You know, I got kicked out of school, left school with. No education whatsoever. Um, usual streets, you know, getting into trouble from a pretty shitty part of London. And um, martial arts just sucked me in. You know, people I went to school with are still in prison from my school days. So it's um, it really did save me, you know, giving me structure, um, discipline, and then I just loved it from there. And that was it. You know, you, you, you do something and you're like, this is what I was meant to do. And that's how I was with martial arts. So I studied, um, I was a assistant instructor for my coach, got my black belt and then opened my first club and then um, it just kind of spiraled from there. And then, um, so I moved over, I, I used to compete amateur, I did six amateurs in the UK um, when MMA just started. Um, it was just basically open tournaments, basically then um, did, um, I did one bare knuckle, that was good fun. And then- um, Bare knuckle bare MMA? Knuckle, MMA, yeah, this before, I mean my professional, debut um was that we didn't even have hand wraps you know they didn't check you had a box or anything it was just um it was yes yeah, things have progressed somewhat since then um and then i moved to australia in um 2003 and um i was working on a building site <clears throat> and um why'd you move here just i well i, tra I traveled i did two years of traveling so um i got to a point i was coming up to my 30s and i wanted to to see a bit of the world so <clears throat> I sold my club, um, my dog just died, so I was like, that's it, fuck, I'm going. And then uh, I travelled, and I travelled for two years. I did all around Asia, America, um, some Mexico, Australia, um, trained and did bits and pieces, and then um, loved Australia. Went back to UK, brought my girlfriend at the time back out, and we got married here, um, and we haven't left, and that was 2003. Um, and, then, um, and then I damaged my back, working on a building site, which was the end of my competitive career, but I just concentrate on coaching since then. I opened my first gym, Platinum Extreme, in um, 2008, I think it was, or 2009. Um, that was the first premium MMA gym in Australia. Um, and that was going really well. And then just uh, this constant struggle of trying to get people through the door in MMA. You know, when I, when I was in the UK, I always talk about UK was kind of five years behind the industry in the US when we were over there. I mean, it was still 
growing really quickly. But when I moved to Australia, it was kind of going back in time again. It was there was still a really lot of negative press around the sport. You know, I was coming to the CFCs and some you guys fight at Luna Park and that. But you know, as an example, my when I'm Platinum Extreme. I literally had people with placards in the car park of my gym from locals trying to get it shut down. They got it shut. We had to go to council two or three times, had to pre presentation to the council board in North Sydney. You know, they thought it was just everyone's house value was just going to drop because there was an MMA gym in the area. It's at McMahon's point. So these all these things. That's always been a problem, man. Eh? House, yeah. house value dropping in McMahon's point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, feel, I feel for them so much. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so that, up at night. That, that's, that's pretty much where I was at. I was just trying to build the sport. I started writing for Men's Fitness Magazine to try and get more content out there. And then um, I came up with the idea of Funtoria because um, no matter what I was doing, it was the same kind of people coming through my gym, just young guys that wanted to do some training in that. So um, I come up with the concept of train one person for free for six months, but they had to agree to compete at the end. And the, the idea was to find someone that you'd never think would do MMA and then document it. I was just going to YouTube it and do a blog and say, look, if this guy can do it, anyone can do the sport. Because I'd seen it, you know, it changed me and I'd seen it with people coming into my gym, but it was the same demographic all the time. So that was the idea. So I put a post on Facebook, my strength coach, Rachel Guy, she had a big following at the time as well. She shared it and we had over 400 people email in one week saying, I want to do it. So that's pretty much how it started. So rather than one person, I took 25. And um, it was kind of, it was very organic then. I was just like, okay, I know I train one person. How do I train 25 people to compete? And, uh, you know, and I made up the program as I went along and, and um, put it all together. And, um, and yeah, and now we've got just under 50 gyms in seven countries. That's awesome. Running the program. And thousands of people go through the program. But for me, it's, it's, um, it's, Jez Pulver come over and spent some time, and he always is the one quote he always said: "It's the beautiful side of MMA. It's the side that people don't see. You, you, people, when they hear the word UF, um, MMA, they always think UFC, and they just think cage fighting. And um, it, there's so much to the sport, you know, um, more than than the professional side. And the sport needs to grow at grassroots. Um, and Winter Warrior has been a big part of that globally now, and." Um, and now I'm involved with IMAF as well, which is the the um, amateur federation, the global federation, trying to grow the for the Olympics and try and get the sport into the Olympics now, which is another big passion play for me. So, but yeah, it's exciting. And, and Nick, um, after the first series, I, I did um, I put a tweet out there and said that you know I was looking for someone to a couple of investors to come in because I wanted to to film the next series and put it on TV because I knew if people saw. Mm -hmm. the journeys of these people they go holy shit that person's like me or that person's like me mm -hmm. so um i needed money to do it so i put a, a put a tweet out and nick contacted me and you got um, lots of money nick i, would, I did once yeah, uh -huh. yeah. when i worked when, when, <laughs> when i worked when i worked full, <laughs> when I worked full time um no, it was actually, it was, it was weird because... Can anyone just ask you for money? Nah. I, was, I was kind of, I needed some money. Yeah, I, just saw, I, I just saw Rob's car. You might want to hit him up. He's, he's got a newer model than me. Um, that was funny, actually, because um, I'd, I'd done um, judo as a kid. Um, Where are you from, Nick? What area? So I'm, I'm from Sydney. I'm the northern beaches of Sydney. So I grew up um, around Newport and Avalon Beach and, and went to school there. Um, you know, uh, mum and dad were both teachers and and um you know I, I played sort of you know a bit of all sport but i wasn't it was kind of weird my dad played um lower grade football for newtown and then eastern suburbs he's good rugby league play back in the day when it was you know really i mean it's really tough now but it was probably a bit dirtier then and um and i tried footy and just i just wasn't that kid i sort of I enjoyed judo and I did that until I was green belt. And it was, it's actually, it's, it's a funny thing that the school then got sold and the new instructors that came in, like I left within six weeks and it shows you how critical a coach can be to someone's enjoyment of the because I loved it up till then. And, um, and that was always a bit of a regret of mine, a bit of a sort of a lament. And so um, <clears throat> I'd been, uh, I'd, I've spent 20 years working in, in uh, financial services and investment markets and, um, kind of went through, you know, university, did the big corporate career. And I was lucky that my company, um, I was running 
the, the private wealth arm of a company called Perpetual um, Investments and, and, and Perpetual sent me to study at Harvard Business School for two and a half months doing this thing called the Advanced Management Program and it's a really big deal and like 300 people a year get to do it um, and it's kind of leading executives from all over the world and so yeah, I went there and, and, um, and did that <clears throat> and that was in 2013 and so a couple of things happened. Number one, you go and live on campus at Harvard Business School, you live there, sleep there, cook all your meals and you just go into this bubble, like completely away from work and your normal life. But um, uh, my wife and my three young boys, because my, my twins were in kindergarten at school back then and my youngest wasn't at school. And so my wife said, well, we'll come and live in Boston and travel around a bit and um, we'll see you on weekends because you were kind of studying six days a week and you get Sunday off and you know I thought well that's a good family thing to do so um, so what happened while we were there is that um, Tanya and the boys were on the finish line of the of the Boston Marathon um, the day the explosions went off no. yeah so I I had uh, I was sitting in class and there's a guy in in my class called Richard Haley who was the chief financial officer for the FBI and um, we got it. Um, my, my wife sent me a text. It was like a gorgeous day in, in, in Boston. And she sent me a text and it was a photo of my three boys on the finish line. Literally 26 mile markers in the background. And then opposite the road is where actually the second bomb went off. And and she said, oh, just an amazing day and whatever. whatever. Um, and I said, yeah, great. I'm going into the next class. I'll chat to you later. And so then like there was kind of a bit of a commotion towards the end of the class about 45 minutes later and then you know I noticed I think Richard had because of his role he had a couple of phones like a civilian phone and a kind of a bat phone or whatever and then someone made an announcement <clears throat> there's been a terrorist attack at the finish line of the Boston Marathon two bombs have been set off but they also jammed all the radio signals because they, they were worried about all the bombs being set off remotely so I actually had 30 minutes where I thought I'm that guy, you know, like, I, you know, you see those tragedies and you think, fuck, like, and, and so I literally had 30, and you couldn't, all the cabs, all that stuff stopped, and where Harvard Business School campus is, it's like a good 45 minute jog to get to central Boston, and I was kind of in full sensory overload, so I just started running along the Charles River and just ringing every five seconds. And then finally my wife answered and she said, we're okay, we're okay, we're okay. And as it turns out, they'd left like maybe 15 or 20 minutes before and they were staying at a, a part of Boston, <clears throat> literally 400 metres from the finish line as the crow flies. And so she thought they were like celebration cannons, you know, like mm. ceremonial cannons at the end of the race. Like they was, she goes, my God, you know. And so, um, so that was like... Because I had that 30 minutes of literally, you know, that sort of thinking everything's ended, um, that kind of interrupted me and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to just go back and get on the, you know, stay on the corporate ladder. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I just wanted to find something, you know, a passion play, something beyond sort of corporate life and literally within a week of getting home. Um, I used to follow a, an old, I'm not even sure if it's still around, but Fight News Australia was, a, was quite an active Twitter account back then. I was a big you know, combat sports fan. I used to watch everything and they, were, they retweeted one of Rich's tweets. And two days later we met in, I'd, so I DM'd him, and two days later we met for a coffee in North Sydney and he told me all about it. And like we can sit here today, you know, six years down the track. And like I literally knew at that moment how big Wimp to Warrior was going to be and how important it was to get people into combat sports and, and martial arts. I didn't know how hard it was going to be. Yeah. but um, So that's how we met and I, and I literally came on board. and um, did the series though. Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I did it in... <clears throat> so it's funny, I could, I, for a very short period of time, I held the record as the oldest person. To, I was 40 at the time when I had... Uh, when I went through it and I had my first MMA fight and it was a little bit more rugged back in the, the very early days with no shin guards, four ounce gloves and people getting, you know, really beat up. But, um, 
but yeah, it was like it was a bit of a bucket list for me. And so I did Rich's Series 2. I'd already come on and invested. And then I went through the program. And I'm like, this, this is amazing. This is a, I've done some, I kind of feel I've been fortunate and done some special stuff. And I'm like, this is one of the most special things I've ever done. And I remember before I walked out, because our, our second finale was at Luna Park and it was being filmed. And, you know, I, I get to have my first ever amateur fight in front of 2,000 people at the big top, you know. And all my mates from financial services came along probably to see me take a couple in the head and whatever else. But, Were you um, middle management? Were you that guy? <clears throat> oh, <laughs> no, no, I was worse. I was executive management. Oh, so no, executive is different because when you get to that level, it's usually because you're smart and you're capable and that. It's a dude that gets stuck in that yeah, middle nah, management. No, I was... You know who you are. You know what I'm about. <laughs> it was funny. It was, even back then, I, um, I raised money for camp quality because... I was going to present, you know, I was sitting at, 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 you know, board level and going to a lot of big investor meetings and I was going in with, you know, little shiners and some lumps and bumps and even in 2014, I thought, I need something to manage the optics because people can be a bit weird. So I thought, I'm going to raise money for camp quality. Nobody could give me shit about fighting MMA if I'm raising money for kids with cancer. And actually, to Perpetual's eternal credit, they did a, a matching gifts program and so staff at Perpetual put in six grand and Perpetual stumped in another six grand. I think I ended up raising 15 grand for Camp Quality. So it was, you know, it was a great kind of uh, experience, but that was, that kind of set the set in motion the fact that we were gonna, you know, grow it a lot bigger and that I wanted to leave corporate life to, to do this because it um, makes me a lot happier. Okay, so, so then what's each, what's, who's, what does each one of you do for Winter Warrior? So, um, so I'm the president um, and uh, international head coach. So <clears throat> basically I run all the series, bring in new gyms. And at the, at the moment I do a lot of stuff that hopefully I won't be doing in the moment. In literally all, like, all the social media, all the marketing, all that kind of stuff. Because when you start a business, you, you literally do everything. Um, and then as the business grows, the hope is you kind of bring in people to, to take care of certain things. And um, there's certain elements of the business that I'm still kind of overseeing but yeah the program itself and and um, I visit gyms and coach on the program and I'm actually working on a on a new program at the moment which I think is going to be probably two or three times bigger than the current program in terms of scope um, which I think is going to be really exciting um, and Nick's Nick's the money man so he gets us all our investment and, and manages all the shareholdings and, and does all the financial side of the business and then we've got an amazing team as well yeah. with us We've got um, another lady, a lady that was on Nick's, Nick's program, um, Kelly. She came on. She was actually my first person to come on. She came in, um, God, she's been with 2014. Yeah, 2014. 2014. She came on full time. Um, and she's been with us ever since. Um, and we've got everyone that works in our, in our business, in our office, has done the program. So that's the way we've done it. Always yeah. recruited, even our digital apart from marketing. My wa- apart from my wife, yeah, that that's going to come. <laughs> but um, even our digital marketing company we use. Um, when we first first started using them, I said, "You you understand to work and with us, you have to fight. You have to do the program. So why do you want to understand it? Like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. And just it took us about three months of just knocking them, knocking them, and in the end, they signed up. They did the program and they had their first fight. And now just to because if you if you think about trying to sell or market something without getting a complete understanding of, of what it's involved and, and how transformational this program is. So that's why it was really important for us to, to get them to do it. And that's, that's the premise. So everyone in our, in our office has, has had their first Sport. amateur fight, yeah. which is very cool. Um, and we've got, more women, we've got more women than blokes, yeah. actually, yeah. too, which is really cool. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's a completely different look for the sport than it used to be. Um, I mean, when I did my first series, um, there was no women in the, in, in the UFC at that point. And I, I actually, at the time, and I always get people send me hate stuff when I say this, but I didn't agree with females being in MMA at the time, back then, you know. Um, and I only, I only said it was for, for guys only, the first series. And I got so many females emailing me, this is, you know, you, you should, equality, you know, it's, it's not a male sport, you should let's do it. But I, and I, in the end, I was like, okay, okay, I just let, I let, we'll get some females in. And ever since, every single fight of the night, on all half and eyes I've been involved with has been the girls. They just, they're amazing. They just, they, they. It's almost like um, they kind of have nothing to prove, but they've got 
a lot to prove as well. There's no ego when they go in and they just they tear it up. And and I've loved the fact that you know in in Sydney in cover of our series now, you know it's 35 40 percent. One of my series I did in my gym in Brookvale, it was 50 50 females and men, which is amazing. You know you think about the sport five years ago. There was there was no women in fight, training MMA gyms, so yeah, that's that's a very cool part of what we're doing. And we got fifty percent of the applicants for our upcoming series in Dublin because we're are we yeah. series four or five? Uh, five. 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 Dublin, yeah, John out of John Kavanagh's gym, and fifty um, percent of the applicants are, are females for for that series, and he's going to run, you know, mm. a, a very big series as he kind yeah, of he's always had does. Yeah, people going, but the. But Dublin is, is a strange one because it's always been, um, you know, most, most of his times he runs a program, he'll have 50 people in the mats and he might get three or four females in there. It's, in Ireland, it's still very much a, a male sport. But there was um, a TV show um, it's called The Wingman and it's on RTE, which is a, it's like the BBC or Channel 9 of, of Ireland. It's like their, their big channel. And the idea of The Wingman, it was a, he was a, a local... Um, um, famous guy from TV and personality comedian, and basically he he took people on a journey, and was their wingman for something that would help inspire them. And anyway, there was a there was a lady. She was I think she's mid forties, high forties. Yeah. In her forties anyway. She was a, a victim of domestic violence. She she beat cancer. Um, she had a rough time, and she was a yoga instructor as well. So she was quite nimble. But anyway, she she wrote into the program says you know I need to do something with my life, and he was like okay. I know what you can do. Took her along to John Kavanagh, and she did um, a condensed program because our program is normally twenty weeks. <clears throat> she did it in three months, but she trained every morning and every evening on the on the Winter Away program, um, and then they filmed it as part of this the Wingman series, and that was aired um, about a month ago now, and that's been a massive shift in in the female female participation yeah. and and just general interest in the sport in Ireland. So literally, it would be five percent meat normally, and now it's it's literally fifty fifty because of that one show, yeah. um, which is amazing. So it's just perception, you know. The whole point of Wind Tour is just trying to change people's perception of the sport. It's not just guys with shaved heads and tattoos. It's anyone can do the sport, and that's that's the only way we're going to grow as a grassroots level. Yeah. And what? So we, as far as um, investment and, and what you do now. You work. You don't work anymore in the thing. You just work full no. time with Wimp to Warrior. Yeah. So I I left my my career, uh, my financial services career in sort of so late. What, what's what's that specifically? When you say financial services and whatnot. Um. So my last job, I was CEO of a large national stockbroking and investments business, and prior to that, I ran uh, private wealth at Perpetual. You know. So um, you know, they were they were sort of executive. Jobs looking after, you know, funds management and, and financial advice and all that sort of stuff. And, and I'm fortunate that as a consequence, I've had a great network of, of people. And I remember actually one of one of our biggest investors to, to date, um, uh, a guy called Hugh Williams, and Hugh will be watching this later, so he'll like this little mention. But he, him and I went for lunch in Manly when I left and said, I'm, I'm going to go run it full time. I, I, look, I've had my money and went to Warrior for a while and, and you know, I just want to literally give it my best crack. I think if Rich and I with Kelly and some others can can really work hard for a couple of years, we might be able to get it to, to something. Because, you know, really believed in the in the sport and, and we, you know, in, once you're inside it, how much it can positively change lives. You just know you've got a big marketing hurdle for the average person to think they can walk into a martial arts gym and say, yeah, I can do that so I but I remember Hugh was Hugh and I were having lunch and he said mate like you're crazy like you're leaving this career to go and do this this is pretty binary kind of bet and um but to his credit he kind of went on the journey with me and then when I was still doing it 12 months later and started thinking about an investment round so we can kind of start to scale up and grow particularly into North America and UK Ireland and then he came on board and and so I've been, you know, we've been simultaneously growing the business a lot, but when you've got global ambitions, you can only grow so much organically off, off self-funded. And it's really fascinating to see the amount of money, private equity, really smart money flooding into MMA now, but it's only coming to one place. It's only coming to the professional promotion. So one championship have raised 250 million bucks through, through Sequoia Capital, which is one of the most famous venture capital firms in the world. 
you know, the, the PFL, um, you know, they rebranded, they've raised, you know, sort of 70 million bucks and, um, you know, Kombache in um, the, the Latin American, have you heard of that promotion, Kombache? Yeah. So they just announced a 30 mil funding round with some pretty famous Latin American um, entertainer came on board and, and that sort of thing. Um, I think when the PFL did their last round, Tony Robbins and Kevin Hart came in. So there's all this money flooding into the, you know, if you call it the MMA ecosystem, if you like, but it's only going to one place at the moment and it's just going to the professional promotions. And really apart from the UFC and, and Bellator, which is making a bit of money now for Viacom, the rest of them, it's just a recipe to burn cash, right? Like over time, they're, they're, they're in a big sort of content play that they're, they're doing, but we're sort of taking the view to say, well, look, <clears throat> we monetize in a different way. Our, our mission is to put millions of people into combat sports gyms and not about going out and putting a, a cookie cutter gym up and saying, come and buy our franchise or any of that garbage because all the best combat sports gyms already exist. Like coaches already own their own gym. We'd rather work with the best coaches to license our program to try and drive new people in to do our programs inside existing um, academies. And, and, you know, the sector, is, the sector is huge and growing. And I'm only up to date on these stats because I've been talking to a lot of investors recently. But, like, there's, there's 79,000 martial arts academies in the United States. Um, employing about 85,000 people. So what that means is there's a whole bunch of one-man bands with probably calling it a dojo with 30 students, but all the way up to sort of far bigger gyms. But in North America, you know, 4 million people a year are members of combat sports gyms. You know, people are sp there's about $5 billion a year spent on training m martial arts more broadly in the US. So we kind of look at all these things and we're saying, well, we want to be a friendly consumer face to get people into these, you know, amazing academies that already sort of, you know, exist. And and obviously having partnered with the gyms we have, I mean, we've run series at AKA in San Jose, El Nino, um, you know, we've... Tristar. Series three is starting at TriStar. <laughs> obviously, um, things are going great with, um, with SBG and all that sort of thing. And so we do know one thing that we're really good at is getting... The kind of audience we bring in to pay fees and do the program are not going to be reached by these gyms marketing martial arts in their traditional way. And the thing we're ultra passionate about is um, all the posts we see where mums in their mid forties with three kids just you know take photos. They're about to, they're fighting in four weeks and going, this thing has saved my life. You know, like and so you know we know inside how special. The, the program is it's just that it's, it's taking a while for people to and the only way you convince other people to do it is just the storytelling so that they see someone like them and they think oh my god if they did it maybe maybe I can do it so that's really what we're trying to you know what we're trying to do and, and thankfully you know things are really starting to to, to move a pace which if we if we do well the, the coaching infrastructure of the sport globally does well. And in that regard, you know, I, I kind of, we're kind of the good guys pr compared to the promotions, if you like, because at the end of the day, the promotions sit in a relationship with the fighter where that transaction is between the talent to maximise how much money they can make out of that talent and try and minimise the amount of money they have to spend on that talent. Whereas what we're saying is heaps of fighters and coaches own their own gyms um, and, and the only way we succeed is if we're literally flooding their gyms with new members to do, to do our programs. We forgot to mention Rufus Sport. We, got a, we just got into yeah, um, cool starting Rufus Sport too. Yeah. So. <clears throat> I have a question for you about something that you mentioned just a second ago. You know, you're talking about um, the MMA ecosystem and the professional uh, setting, and you mentioned like PFL and mentioned um, a couple of other leagues, 1FC. Mm. How do you see that the flood of that money going in other than, of course, UFC's at the top. Yeah. Then you have Bellator and the rest, like you said, is like, you know, burning money kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But how do you see that as a change, like uh, from an investment perspective, say in the next 10 years, do you see that changing? 
Yeah, I mean, I see it just being a, a monopoly for want of a better term with the UFC still in ten years, or um, I mean, I don't think it'll be, I don't think it'll be a monopoly. But I think what's interesting to watch is um, who owns ESPN is Disney, the deepest pockets in the world, right? Um, and ESPN, you know, obviously making some plays around what they see as huge content. ESPN bought the broadcast rights to the PFL, so PFL is going to benefit from shadow programming with the with the UFC. Um, you know, Bellator have probably done really well in Europe, particularly yeah. where we are perhaps... investing a lot in, in youth and, and the next generation of fighters, in, yeah. in, which I think is a big difference between Bellator, what I've seen, and someone like the UFC. It's all about five years' time with those guys. Yeah, and, yeah. and then, you know, one championship... They're obviously going after this. This we're going to be the UFC of the East, if you like. Now, and the guy running one, um, Chatri, is a is an ex hedge fund guy. He's a Harvard MBA. He's a really smart dude, and he's convinced some very smart investors to tip in a huge amount of money. Um, so, I think it's in the it's certainly in the interests of fighters that we get more competition for um, for for talent and and contracts, and particularly. I think it's it's not in dispute that the UFC title is absolutely the gold standard of what any elite athlete, anyone in MMA. But when you you imagine if you're Eddie Alvarez, right, and you won the UFC title, you beat Dos Anjos, you lose to Connor, and then do you keep fighting in that absolute Shark Tank at 155 in the UFC? And I know it didn't work out in his first fight. Or do you take, you know, what I presume was a ton more money? to go to, and maybe it's not an easier roster, but it looks like it probably is. And so you kind of think it's a, I think it's a good thing for, for fighters, but obviously over time, those properties are gonna have to, you know, indicate the ability to, to turn a profit. And so, you know, of, you know, huge respect to the Fatita brothers and Dana White. I watched the doco that was released the other day on YouTube where, you know, they recounted the story, you know, they bought it for two million bucks. They go forty-five million dollars in the hole, which is just massive. They do the Ultimate Fighter deal. They pay for the whole show to be produced through Spike, and then things start to ramp from there. And then they sell it and get out. But um, you know, and I've heard I've heard rumours that that Bellator is going to make some decent money for Viacom this year, and 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 that wasn't happening before, which is what you would expect. And the guys who invested in one. They didn't tip in that much money because they think they're going to turn it round in, in a year. But the play has when to be. When you say the guys, <clears throat> the guys that investing money into one, mm. like, uh, do you know, like, like, what kind of people it is that's mm. investing? No, but I know the so Sequoia India, um, you know, one of the most prestigious venture capital firms in the world. So they're really smart people. They didn't just punt. They don't punt. You know, they're on their third series funding round. One championship's probably valued at over a billion dollars. I mean, they don't disclose it from, but they've got a lot of cash. So $250 million gives you a lot of runway to buy quality fighters and contracts, to put on great events, and to build your distribution footprint, your broadcast footprint. Now, obviously, one are going, well, Asia's the home of, of martial arts, and we are looking at you know, an audience in here of, you know, billions of people and we want to make we want to make a martial arts product that is less Western centric, like clearly the UFC and Bellator is, and we want to make something that appeals to sort of Asian taste. So my take on it from an investment guy standpoint is there is a lot of very clever money backing the sport and I think that's a great thing because we all benefit from those kind of tailwinds. If that kind of money's being pumped in, that means it's being broadcast on way more TV stations. It means uh, more mainstream sponsors are coming on board. It means fighters, particularly elite fighters, you know, Rob and others, you know, have the opportunity to get a better platform. So, um, and, it, and it helps us, right? So, yeah. So you see, like, companies like the PFL and whatnot, you see them being, being able to make some big waves? Well, I, forward. I do because I don't. When you know the the caliber of the investment firms that have gone in on this, they don't go in to put in forty million bucks two rounds in a row and then it torch it. And they know they're playing a long game. They know that 
this is going to be a five to seven year journey to build you know um, their space in in the you know the broadcast sports landscape so obviously PFL have gone well we're going to do the anti UFC and Bellator thing complete meritocracy or it's almost like you know it's you a go tournament. Through, yeah it's a tournament you know yeah. and it's it, it's pure it's far more sport based than prize fighting based so all my layman's view on it is knowing how smart the firms that have put money in they know they've got to play the long game here they picked up ESPN broadcast so yeah I think they're going to keep pumping money in and, and investing in it and growing it and that's great for fighters okay and your yourself uh, rich so what, what where, what's your what are you guys planning on doing next so what's your next projects um, next project for me is um, is the new training program. Um, Can I'll you speak on that, or um, yeah, I, I mean the idea behind it is um, to have a an easier entry point into the sport. So, Winter Warrior is, although it's all about getting brand new people into the sport, um, it's still there's still some barriers, and and this is the stuff that my team are you know in the in the office are dealing with all the time. Is if people when 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 something's um, seen as a challenge, people look for objections and, and excuses to get out, you know, and people sign up to an interior program, yeah, I'm good to do this, I tell the mates, and then they're like, oh, and they, they look for excuses. And the, the three big things for Winter Warrior is, is um, the duration of the program, you know, it's over five months, so some people don't know what they're going to be doing in two months' time. So um, with their job, are they going to travel? Um, and then um, the, the fact that there's a, there's a fight at the end, that puts people off. Um, and as much as we know that's the most transformational part is working towards that and going through all those demons and getting the mental strength to do it, um, there's still an opportunity to bring more people in when we remove that aspect of the program. So um, it's a shorter program um, where it's... It, there, and there'll be stages, there'll be... Um, um, beginners, intermediate, and advanced stages of it as well, but it's it's more about making it a an easier point to entry into the sport rather than you know it's five months and you know there's a fight at the end. So, um, but I honestly believe that anyone that does the short version, by the time ten weeks comes when the program's finishing, they're like, holy shit, I need to keep going. What can I do next? And then, okay, now you're in. You understand it's not scary, you know, and this gym isn't no one's dying and the coaches are really invested in your journey, then it's a, it's an easy, easier entry point into the main program, which is, which is obviously our full program where they, they get to compete at the end. So that's, that's the big project I'm working on at the moment. And then, um, um, like I said, I'm working with IMAF um, on this as well. I'm going over to Rome in a couple of weeks um, to speak to those guys. They've, they back up our current program. They've recognized it as a, as, as a, um, they're part of their new syllabus base. So MMA, for, for mixed martial arts to get into the Olympics, there's several things that, that need to happen. Um, at the moment, it's just seen as this prize fighting art, you know, different martial arts coming together and fighting. It's not seen as a, as a sport. Um, and that, that's the problem we're having with, with progressing towards getting into Olympics. Um, and then when you look at other martial arts, even in the Olympics like Taekwondo, like... Um, um, Amateur boxing. Amateur boxing. There, you have to, there's, with the martial arts more, like Taekwondo and Judo and stuff, there, there has to be a progression system. There's got to be, you can't have a guy that's been training five years suddenly compete with someone that's been training six months. So without a belt system or a leveled system, um, it, that's, that's almost impossible to do, to get fair matchups. So um, the, they've been working on this new, it's not belt system because there's no we don't wear geese or anything, but a leveled system, a coloured leveled system for syllabus base that people can then train, um, structured training program and go through the levels. And so when they want to compete, the idea is that just like if you go to jiu jitsu comp, you know you don't want a, a white belt competing against a purple belt. Mm. So it's the same thing. And these are all the, the tick boxes that we've been working on. So we're ro rolling out all this new syllabus base. So I'm working with. Um, running coaching courses, accrediting coaches under the IMAF system, um, and then rolling out a new syllabus, which is um, really exciting, um, which I'm really excited about. And then obviously I'm going over to Rome to go through this new training program with the guys as well. Um, there is a, a really unique part of the program, which um, I'm happy, I'll come back in a few weeks and tell you, I'll, I'll message you guys and tell you about it, but 
I don't want to, until I speak to IMF and get them to give yeah. me a stamp of approval, but it's, it's going to fundamentally change the way people train in mixed martial arts, which I think is going to be an e easier entry point again for the sport. Do you guys have kids? Yeah. Yep. You have, you said before, you have yep. kids. Do they play a sport? So, yeah, my, um, so my boys have been doing jujitsu for five years now. So they actually started How in, old are in, kids? in Boston. So my twins have just turned 13 and my youngest is about to turn 11. They play, you know, rugby and for the school and basketball and, you know, they still do, ju they've done jujitsu twice a week for, for sort of five years. So, um, you know, you, and I think as well as a parent, um, albeit I'd sort of consider myself a fairly strict dad, I always know when I go to, they go to jujitsu, they step on the mats, they've got, they've had their same professor for, for, for five years. Where are they train at? Are they trained at, at Warrywood at Pacheco Jiu-Jitsu? Okay. Up at Warrywood and, and uh, and it's just, it's good to see young kids, you know, be disciplined and behave and instructed, whether it's a sporting coach, whether, you know, footy coach, their jiu-jitsu professor, whatever. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's such a huge benefit to to, um, to have them involved in it and it makes me feel guilty that I don't get back and train as often as I should. You don't get on the mats at all? Oh, uh, no. It doesn't. Uh, <laughs> occasionally. Oh, but it's it's a bit of a, it's, it's a sore point because, you know, Rich and I, we conservatively, we've been working 16 hours a day, seven days a week on this thing for two and a half years. And and other things sort of suffer, but we're getting to a, a point, breakthrough where, you know, one of my big goals this year, particularly post this, this funding round and, and, and all the work we're doing on that finishing is that, you know, I've, I've sort of said I'm 45 now. I did, I did want to have one more fight. I didn't want to be, it's kind of weird. I didn't want to be one and done because I look at, I look at the people who do Wimp to Warrior and probably maybe, what do you reckon, seven or eight percent would fight again or 10 percent would 10, actually, yeah, 10%. about 10 percent would, would have the second fight. And I've always looked at that thinking that's, and ironically, it's way more women have the second fight. Mm. You know, mm. blokes less so. Whenever we've got, you know, we need a short um, notice match up or something like that, all the blokes, it's always the same, you know. Uh, uh, if I had a bit more time. If I had a bit more And the, just the girls just like, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll do it. So, yeah, so, yeah it's, well, this is on the record now, but I've, I have said that I've wanted to, you know, go back and, and, um, and train again and, and have one more before I'm completely done. So we'll see. Okay, and yourself, how are your kids? Yeah, yeah, so I've got um, three kids as well. Um, daughter's six, she's just, she's about six months into jiu-jitsu now, and then my two boys have been doing it for a few years as well now, so yeah, they love it. Um, I live on the Central Coast, so my, my oldest, who's 10, about turn 11 actually next week, he's, um, he does jits twice a week, but then he surfs and skateboards and all this kind of stuff, but yeah, I think it's really important for kids. Um, I'm a massive advocate of kids doing martial arts. Um, and I want to I want to open up a gym on Central Coast at some point, maybe in the next twelve months. What kind of gym? Um, uh, an MMA gym, um, and some of the stuff working with IMF now, we're we're making it much more um, kid friendly. You know, new rule sets, map based competitions, all this kind of stuff for kids um, and adults as well. Um, at the moment, I mean, I I don't like the idea of kids getting into a cage, for instance. I don't think it's a it's a good look. Um, personally, and I think it's a PR disaster for our sport. Uh, all the people that hate our sport, it's just like, thank you very much. You've just done our job for us. Mm. I think having um, having kids to be able to compete in mixed martial arts on a mat is so much better. Um, so yeah, all these all these things. But my kids, uh, my kids um, enjoy enjoy it very much. Getting on the mats and rolling and stuff, it's cool. Do you play the? Where are you from in England? London, West London. Oh, okay, West London. No, because uh, Liverpool just won the. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Are you are you a Liverpool fan or? No, but I like the fact that they won because. Um, Who they played Tottenham? Tottenham, because Tottenham are the one of our. So I, I grew up near Chelsea was my local team. All my mates were Chelsea. I, I didn't support Chelsea, but Tottenham and Chelsea are massive rivalry. So, yeah, all my mates. So you were going for Liverpool over Tottenham? Yeah, and as a kid, I was a massive Liverpool fan. Like. Oh, so you were a Liverpool fan as a kid? Yeah, not not How as an come? adult. Just, I, is just, Liverpool south? No, it's north. 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 It's up by Manchester. Okay. So, but as a kid, it, it that's was, why they, they have a really strong the accent. Eh, the, oh, yeah, very much. Yeah, the Republicans have got a very strong accent. But they were the team. Like they won the Euros several times back then. 
Uh, my my bedroom, it's, I had Liverpool bed sheets, wallpaper, I had the whole team around it. I was mad on Liverpool. <laughs> um, but then when I went to, when I 11, when I moved schools and stuff, and then I got into boxing and I kind of lost track of, of football, soccer, you guys call soccer. it. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's massive. Like I got a lot of big Liverpool fans and they're still partying right now. Um, over in the UK, but it's, it's big. It's funny with, with football, every Brazilian I know, they either support, it's Corinthians, or what's the other big mega club in Brazil? Uh, is it Flamengo? No, Flamengo no. I just, it's funny, the only time I hear, um, you know, they're talking about football, it's either, I remember we've got off planes and, you know, run to catch World Cup games. Yeah. And that, and then, I don't watch soccer at all. Don't you? No, no. No, there's my a, dad does. I don't at yeah, all. Right. I wouldn't be able to name like my whole family plays, but I wouldn't even be able to name like more than four teams in the A League. I don't think. Yeah, I'm the nah. same now. I don't yeah. unless it's the Europeans or the the World Cups. I know I'll always watch the World Cup, um, but I don't. I don't get to watch. We're state of origin tomorrow. That's more important. Oh yeah, that's true. It's more important to us anyway. <laughs> that's true. Do you watch that? Yeah, I watch the state of origin. Yeah, I like anything that's that's you know the pinnacle of any sport. I think he's always good to watch, uh, but I'm not. I'm not a big league fan, to be honest. So, so have you guys got any involvement with like is Wimper Warrior got any involvement with like rugby teams or rugby league teams or anything like that? Is that something you guys are looking at? at all? We, we haven't yet, but we. Because uh, you know they used to do the the I don't know if they used to. I think they still do like you know the corporate boxing fights and that. Yeah. Yeah, like no, yeah. nothing yeah. like that with the football teams. No, we. I mean, it's something. Proper association would be interesting to explore over time. I mean, I'm up up at um, Newport, so I've been a Manly Seagulls fan for forever, and um, and uh, you know my, my boys, we go along and see the games all the time. But I know that obviously, you know, most of the top rugby league boys, they're all massive MMA fans, and and obviously they train a lot. Um, you know, you you guys coach and that sort of thing. I mean, you know, wrestling and. The grapple and it's it's so funny when you see when you've when you've you know trained jujitsu and other things like that and you see um, you watch the rugby league tackle and you see all the just the little movements to to slow the play of the ball to slow the guy being able to post to get up and all those kind of technical things that you know form part of grappling based combat sports so um, yeah I, it'd be we would like to you know broaden our association with you know with with some sporting teams and also we're pretty keen to get into mental health advocacy too um yeah. a lot of people who do our programs they're kind of signing up for a a bit of a circuit breaker uh, kind of a life circuit breaker and we a lot of people come and tell us later that they've been fighting anxiety depression whatever else and so um so that's something over the next 12 months we're sort of keen to to partner with the the right advocacy groups but make sure that we've got a platform globally like not just partner with someone in australia and that's good for here because like there was a post we shared on our instagram this morning we get a fair few veterans in the us um and we've had veterans mm. actually um one of our um the head coach of our program in manchester martin stapleton is a you know ex multiple tours of afghanistan and mm. um he's had a number of veterans come in and go through the the program and and the thing about Wimp to Warrior, it, it is obviously so immersive because you're training first thing in the morning five mornings a week for 20 weeks that kind of becomes your new new family and so it's interesting how veterans groups have, have sort of gravitated to um you know towards the program and we we want to do more in that space too and that's very interesting that's that's awesome guys we're running out of time we have been gone for an hour now um just i guess What's what's next for you guys? What's a, what's a shout out for, that you guys want to do for people? What you want to make people aware of the, your projects? Should I talk specifically? about the app, really? um, Well, I was I was going to talk. I mean, first foremost, we've got a bunch of programs launching around the country coming. We're not, when I say this, I'm not rushing you out. I just no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to get the message out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate it. Out of time. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, yeah, we've got a bunch of new programs launching. Um, Dan Kelly starting his second season down in Melbourne at the moment. Um, we've got new programs launching up on the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast and in Sydney. So check out wimptowarrior.com to see all the locations around the world you can train. And for those who are listening um, overseas, you know, it's we've got- It's probably my mum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Never too old. <laughs> we got um, yeah, we got our first series coming up at Rufus Sport, which we're yeah. super excited about. Duke Rufus is so passionate about amateur involvement in, in martial arts, and it's, you know, it's another really cool thing for for us to be there. And um, and yeah, we're going through a, we're going through a um, a funding round at the moment, so we've gone through a process where previously we've gone and got some some big heavy hitting investors to to come and invest money, and we we sort of reflected on some new ways to raise money and, and we're going down the, the crowd equity path for, for an upcoming... What does um, that mean? So it's an investment round where, like, the last investment round we did, it was only for, you know, ultra high net worth, sophisticated investors. So unless they were going to put in a hundred grand or something like that, they couldn't invest in the round. And that's often the case with small privately held companies. Um, but then um, there's some new legislation in Australia that allows companies to raise money through what they call crowd equity and it's it's actually really cool because um it's the notion that you can have you can own a little bit or invest a little bit in the brands you love and it means people can actually buy shares and and buy shares in in our company and sort of follow the journey so but are you a public does you have to be publicly listed you do not no you can be a private company um so there's new legislation through through asic um we're using a, a platform called virtual um and they, that, that platform itself um, has worked with a number of Australian companies to, um, to raise money through crowdfunding rounds. And so when you're a, a consumer brand like we are and, and you've got a lot of following and that sort of thing and you've raised successfully in the past, it can be a good opportunity for us to go out and instead of raising big checks from a handful of um, people to actually go out and say, well, you know, people who've done the program, they might want to invest a a thousand bucks, buy some shares and, and participate in the journey. And it's still, you know, we're still considered a, not quite a startup, we're more of a scale up, but we're still early stage private equity. So it's, um, it's an exciting time that a company like us um, doesn't have to necessarily be going overseas and, and looking for money. It'd be, you know, most of our income is going to come from our overseas gyms going forward as we, as that we grow in those really big markets. But it would be really cool if we could stay an Australian-owned company as long as we, we can, and that this is just sort of another step to um, to enable, you know, anyone who wants to chuck a few bucks in and own some shares and and, and watch our journey. That's unreal. That's pretty cool. That's mm. interesting what you're saying there about that. Mm. <laughs> and so, and from your perspective, Rich, what what? Uh, yeah, I think um, you I said mean, something about an app. Yeah. So that part of the crowdfund that we're doing is is we're gonna. We could create an app, um, which um, a lot of it's more about supporting what we do currently. Uh, the the last thing we want to do is we don't want to en encourage like YouTube warriors that people learn techniques rather than going to a gym. Mm. But it's to support people that actually doing our program and and get to training. You think about all the amazing coaches that that do the Winter Warrior program. You know we we've got some um, some really um, talented coaches out there, um, giving them a platform. We've got guys that people we haven't heard of that are amazing coaches that run our program. We can give them a platform and have some nice training techniques. And we, I mean, you know, um, we work with George Lockhart as well. So, you know, probably get some nutrition on there, some strength conditioning, but just have um, this hub where anyone that's kind of in amateur MMA and that wants to, to learn some cool stuff and, and get trained by some people to, to go. So that's something that we're, we're looking to launch later on this year on top of the other, the new training programs and stuff, which is, which is good. Yeah. And we had, of course, we didn't talk about it yet, but um, but Titus obviously did. Yeah, Titus did Winter Warrior. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Winter Warrior. Yeah. Titus, who was on our, was on our shows, uh, Rob's manager, had a had a fight. I was there. Fight. Yeah, I was there for that one. What, what did you think of the fight, Titus? I thought it was great. Just took him down. Yeah. Like, then it was a ground and pound finish, wasn't he? He got the finish in the second. Yeah. I think. Yeah, it was just just took him down repeatedly. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> he's a rugby. He's ex rugby player, yeah, right? Yeah, and he's he obviously he's very athletic, yeah. very strong. So yeah, just just took him down, and then and he, he's been doing jujitsu for a little bit. Yeah, like mm. not not a great deal, but like during the program, he just took to it. He's yeah. had a good build. For I think it. he did yeah. judo when he was a kid too. Did he? I'm pretty sure he did judo as a kid. Did he say anything about like to you in terms of how like how he found the fight? Was it harder or easier than he expected? Anything like that or? The one thing that, that, that I, I have a good chuckle at is that yeah. before, like I was talking to him before the fight, yeah. and I go, well, what's the game plan? He goes, you know what, 
I think I want to stand and bang. <laughs> think, Titus, you should not <laughs> stand with anyone. I think I want to stand and bang just to get a feeling for it. And I go, what are you thinking? <laughs> are you out of your mind? Just take him. Because he's, he's played rugby his whole yeah. life. And he's strong. And he, I was like, yeah. take him down. Yeah. Repeatedly. That's it. And then just cream it, like, just cheese out a win. He's a big, strong guy. Yeah. yeah. Was like, just why make the fight harder than you need to? <laughs> and he goes... All right, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't happening. I wasn't impressed, but he did it and he got the win, you know. So it was good. Uh, is he getting uh, the feeling of doing another one? Is he I'm not sure. It? I'm not sure. Like I, I think, I think he was he was itching to perhaps go again, but mm. I don't know. I'll, I'm seeing him later this week, so I'll speak to him then. Yeah, so good eye. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll, we'll. I spoke to him uh, about you guys. Uh, I think yesterday, the day before, I was just talking. We, it came up as well. But um, yeah, no, he liked it. He was he thought it was a pretty cool experience in that. So, yeah, so it was cool. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, I mean, we've had people in their fifties doing the program now, which is insane. That fifty six or fifty seven is our oldest now. Yeah, we had two guys fight in Manchester. It was one at like maybe the co-main event or something, and they had like they had a thousand people there in the in the hall in Manchester, and they put on the full because that's one thing we do pride ourselves on. People who fight under Wimtawari get the full Saturday night fight experience. They they get high production standards. They get you know, a full house, great sort of event. And these two guys in Manchester... 107 um, combined age. Yeah, combined age of 107. Had their first <laughs> MMA fight. Mate, but they did the... That's the story, eh? That's but the they story. did the full 20 weeks. They barely yeah. missed a day. They yeah. dropped a ton of weight and um, then they um, just one, wanted to get it there and throw it. One of the guys um, had two heart attacks previously. <laughs> yeah, started not true. <laughs> no, he got the full bill of health from his doctor, but that just goes to show you he lost a ton of weight and yeah. he's... A, He's just amazing now. <laughs> it's just like, holy shit. One, one real quick story, and I, I love telling this, just about diversity of Winter Warrior. There was a girl um, on our Cork series in Ireland who did the program, and um, she finished, I think she did the first series. They're on like series four now, five. Um, <clears throat> and she was trying to get her mum to do the program because all these people in their 40s and 50s. And she's like, no, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not comfortable with it. But her grandma said, I'll do it. So her grandma signed up, right? She did the whole program, and there's uh, my favourite picture. Of, we've got some amazing pictures of finales and stuff from all around the world. But my favourite picture, there's, there's this picture of the, the granddaughter's in the corner, her grandma, who, at her first fight. And her grandma's standing up like this, shaking out. And there's this picture of like, her daughter, granddaughter looking up. And she's cornering her grandma in her first MMA fight. And she went on. She had another three amateur fights after that. I think she won all three or maybe she lost one. But that, to me, that's before... Before we tour, you'd never think of, you'd never, someone told you that story with that, that's the complete bullshit. Yeah. You, people in their 50s don't do MMA. Well, yes, they do. Yeah. So that, that's the kind of stories I love about the program. It's um, such a cool story. Yeah, and we've had, I mean, even last big finale in Dublin, um, one of Conor McGregor's good, really good mates did it, and he fought mm. in the main event, and then sort of, you know, unbeknownst to everyone, Conor came in for the, for the night, went to the whole thing, but... Went out the back, spoke to every fighter, getting their hands wrapped, took photos with everybody, and and that's the thing when I talk, when people ask me about the the athletes in the sport, and you know Rob always comes across as you know a really great media performer, young family, well spoken guy, but the athletes in MMA, even at the elite level, are so much more accessible um, mm. to the average person than you know mega stars in other sports. Like the idea that. <clears throat> You can go in and get on the mats in SBG and do your Wimp to Warrior program and John Kavanagh and a whole range of people are going to take you through your, your program. And you, you're there on the same mats that, that Connor's trained or whatever else. It's look at Rufus Sport with them coming up. TriStar, you know, all that kind of thing. And we look at that and go, well, if it was the NBA, who could go and do an, an, you know basketball fantasy camp and be using the Cavaliers locker rooms and, you know, where LeBron was? I mean... That's the thing that makes it also very cool and special that the stars of the sport are so approachable and level-headed, and it's a yeah, it's a really cool, cool part of what what we do, and and it's a very cool part of the sport as well that the the top end, the elite like Rob and others, are so good. To, I mean, when when Rob was supporting Titus, but like you must have taken two hundred picks that night. Everyone in the crowd, there was seven hundred people at the at the sold-out um, Norse Leagues. And I remember saying to Richard one stage, God, is he going to get sick of having to take selfies with everyone? Because literally everyone's coming up. He's it's the middleweight champs here, right? It's a big deal. Um, 
But again, you know, the athletes are so accommodating and so real, and you just don't get that in, mm. in other sports. So it kind of it makes you really proud of the, the sport you represent at a grassroots level. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Well, thank you so much, guys, for coming in. I know it's been a bit of a drive for both of you. That's all right. Thanks. So, thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. It's fun. This will be up now anyways. It'll be up live. So. Yeah, cool. No worries. Thank Appreciate you very much. Thanks thank a lot. Boys. Thanks, boys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.